The Pell Grant is some of the best government money that your student could possibly receive for college. Now, you might be wondering why that is, and the reason is because it doesn't have to be paid back. Also, it's not based on competitiveness, so your student doesn't have to write essays or interview or submit recommendation letters or anything like that for it. Now, that said, in order to receive this money, families do need to complete a few specific steps correctly. So in today's video, I'm going to cover what the Pell Grant is, how they calculate who receives this debt-free money, and how your family can increase your chances of receiving the money. I'm also going to cover some of the biggest mistakes that families make when it comes to applying to the Pell Grant so that you can avoid making those mistakes too. Hello, my name is Jocelyn Pearson, and all of this knowledge comes from our program, The Scholarship System and Debt-Free Degree Lab, which is an online blog, a course, and a community for parents trying to figure out how to get their students through college with as little debt as possible. Now, if you are new here, please hit the subscribe button because we are releasing a new strategy every single week that you can use to get your student towards that debt-free degree. Let's go ahead and begin. So what is the federal Pell Grant? The federal Pell Grant is debt-free money that does not have to be paid back. It is from the federal government and it is something called an entitlement grant. So what this means is that your student, if they are eligible for it, they get it no matter what school they go to as long as that school receives government funding and accepts FAFSA. Now, this is one of the largest grants that is offered by the Department of Education, and it was created back in the 70s for undergraduate students. Now, the amount changes a little bit. It increases every single year, but at the time of recording this, the maximum amount that a student can receive for this per year is around $6,500, and then it phases out depending on the level of your family's financial need. Towards the end of this video, I'm going to show you how schools calculate what a student can receive and give you a few suggestions on how you might be able to up that number. Now there's two different ways that a student can receive this money. They can either receive it through their account at the university, it can be paid directly to the student, or it can be a combination of both. Comment below now, will your student be applying for the Pell Grants? Do you plan to submit FAFSA? If so, then that is a way to submit for Pell Grant. I'll explain that in a moment, but go ahead and comment below. Did you plan on applying for this? Did you not? If you did not, let me know why, because I'd love to respond back. Maybe I can help you overcome that. Okay, so let's talk about who is eligible for the Pell Grant. First and foremost, they have to be a U.S. citizen or a qualified non-citizen. They also have to be an undergraduate student. Pretty much, they do they cannot already have an undergraduate degree. There is There are a few exceptions to this, pretty much only for teachers that are getting recertification programs. So for the most part, your student, it has to be their first undergraduate degree. Now, they have a maximum of 12 terms that are allowed, which if your student is a traditional student doing a fall and spring semester, then that would be considered two terms. So it'd be basically for six school years. Or if your student is doing a summer term, then that would be three used per year. So over four years, it would be fall, spring, and then summer, that's three times the four years, that's the 12 maximum total. Now, a lot of families, they always hear, you have to be low income in order to receive money. There is plenty of money out there that is not based on you being low income. However, the Pell Grant is one that is typically based on financial needs. So the way that they measure this is by their EFC, which stands for Expected Family Contribution. And this number is the number that you receive once you have completed and submitted FAFSA. So the only way to ever be eligible for this, to ever be considered for this money, is by submitting FAFSA. Now I have a separate video on common FAFSA mistakes and how to access FAFSA scholarships, so make sure you check that out because I really stress the importance of this critical form in order to access money, especially if your family is potentially on the lower income side. Now there are some changes coming up that they're calling FAFSA simplification. Once those changes come into play, the EFC is going to be renamed the Student Aid Index. So when that happens, it's pretty much the same exact thing as far as the number of the results that you get from FAFSA. Now, when I say that your student has to have financial need, typically that means that they have a low EFC or SAI, Student Aid Index. Now, when we're talking about low, 
it can be around $6,000 or less in order to qualify for money through the Pell Grant. However, there are always exceptions. So again, even if your family gets a higher number than that, you don't want to just assume that you won't get this money. At the link in the description, there is actually a table that the government shares showing how much Pell Grant money a student receives based on their EFC. So again, you can't really get this until you know your EFC by submitting FAFSA, but once you get an idea of what that is, you can actually look at this table and get an idea for what kind of money your student qualifies for. Now, one last point I wanna make around submitting FAFSA it does open up October 1st of your student's senior year and you want to resubmit it every single year. So basically you're submitting it every fall until your student is graduating from college. Again, we'll link to our FAFSA video, FAFSA Scholarships 101 in the description below. So make sure you check that out for more information on FAFSA so that you don't make some critical mistakes that can hurt your chances of receiving this debt-free money. Now, like I mentioned, there are some exceptions with this, which include teacher programs. But another exception with this is if your student's EFC is a little bit higher, but they have lost a parent to the military or being on the front line of duty, then they might be eligible to have their EFC lowered to zero and then they would receive the maximum Pell Grant. So this of course is an exceptional situation and uh, something that you definitely want to look into if your family has experienced that. Now again, I mentioned that if your family is not eligible for the Pell Grant, there is still tons of debt-free money out there and lots of sources that don't even necessarily ask for the EFC. And so the biggest opportunity is scholarships. And so I'm going to include a link to a free training below where you can learn exactly where to find those scholarships that are legitimate and have less competition so that your student can also apply for those. So even if your student does get this grant, the Pell Grant, or if they do not get the Pell Grant, no matter what, you want to be applying to those scholarships. So make sure you check out that free training in the description below. So let's get into how they calculate calculate what your student would get with the Pell Grant. So the government is standardizing this process. That's the idea. They're trying to simplify this and that is going to come with those simplification changes that are coming up over the next few years. But again, truly it comes down to your expected family contribution or your SAI, that number that you get as a result from FAFSA. Now the calculation of that depends on a lot of things, including how many assets you have as a parent, how many assets your, your student has, do they have a 529? There's so many different numbers that are factored into it. Now from there, your student's school will have a COA, which stands for cost of attendance. This number is not just tuition, but it is all the costs and expenses that your student can expect to have to pay for their degree. So it is a total estimated cost. So when you're looking at that chart that I mentioned before that I'm going to link to on the government's website, you will see cost of attendance on one side and you will see EFC on another side. So the higher the cost of attendance, of course, the more that the student will need. Now then your student gets their EFC, their number from FAFSA. And now one quick fact with this is that if you have multiple children in college, that number is divided by them. So say your expected family contribution comes back at 30,000 and you have two students in school at the same time, in college at the same time, your EFC, your expected family contribution would actually be 15,000 per child. This is something that's supposed to be changing with that simplification, but we're going to keep you all updated with those changes as they come. Now, when you take cost of attendance and subtract your expected family contribution, then you are left with a gap and that gap is considered your student's financial need. This is important for when I tell you how you can try to maximize money. The other thing I wanna mention with this is even if your student is told that they don't get a Pell Grant, they don't qualify for this money, your student is eligible to appeal. Now comment below if you would love a video on how to appeal to the school for more funding for your student's education. Let me know in the comments. You can just say something like appeal video, please. And if I get enough comments below on that, I'll go ahead and create that soon. Okay, so lastly, let's talk about how can we get more financial support based on this submission? Now, the first thing is, of course, minimizing the EFC. As you can see, that number really determines a lot of things when it comes to the Pell Grant. And so we want to try to bring that down to as little as possible. So one of the things is minimizing our income level. Now, when we're looking at our income level, one of the ways to do that is actually to contribute to retirement accounts. So they take out the money that you're moving into retirement. So of course, you don't wanna do this with money that you need, 
need. You don't want to have to pull it back out of the retirement accounts and pay all the penalties. But if you have the flexibility to max out those accounts or to increase your contributions, that can bring down the amount that's used in calculating the EFC. A second one is to get the assets out of your student's name. Any assets in your student's name are going to count at a greater percentage towards that expected family contribution number than any assets that are in the parents' names. So this is a very quick way that you can reduce that EFC. Third, you wanna make sure that you are submitting FAFSA correctly. So if you are submitting it incorrectly, maybe you're including numbers that you don't need to include, like retirement numbers that shouldn't be factored into your assets, or maybe I've seen divorced families where they thought that they had to put both households income levels on there. That's not true. So you wanna make sure that you're submitting FAFSA correctly because if not, it can actually cost you a lot of money if you're accidentally increasing your EFC when you don't have to be. Now we have tons of different strategies inside our debt free degree lab monthly program. Every single month we're talking about strategies like this, how to minimize your income, how to change, how to maximize tax credits, how to minimize EFC, all these things. And so if you're interested in that, you can learn more at the link below. Just look for debt free degree lab and click that link and you can learn about it. So just a quick recap. The Pell Grant is a federal grant that does not have to be paid back. It is based on financial need. However, there are some things that you can do in order to increase your chances of getting there. And your student must be a citizen or an, a qualified citizen in order to be eligible, as well as an undergraduate student. Now, don't forget to comment below. I ask you for two things. First is, do you plan to submit FAFSA in order to apply for the Pell Grant? And second, do you want that appeal video? If so, write appeal video, please. And lastly, do not forget to subscribe because again, every single week you're getting a free strategy on here on how to work towards that debt-free degree. I'll see you in the next video.